Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank President Barack Obama and the staff of the White House for inviting us to drop in, to come by. Now, I'm delighted, very happy, and very pleased to be here. Some of you may know that I didn't grow up in a big city like Atlanta or Washington, D.C., or New York, or Buffalo, or Chicago. I grew up in rural Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery, outside of a little place called Troy. And when we would visit the little town of Troy, or visit Montgomery, or Birmingham, I saw those signs that said, white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. And I would come home and ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, and my great-grandparents, why? They would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But one day in 1955, 15 years old in the 10th grade, I heard the Rosa Parks. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on our radio. The action of Rosa Parks, the words and leadership of Dr. King inspired me to find a way to get in the way, to get in trouble, what I call good trouble, necessary trouble. It is time for each of you as young leaders to get in trouble, good trouble, get in the way, and make some noise. You have the ability, you have the capacity to, to do it. Just do it. When you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, Speak up, speak out, be persistent and consistent. We grew up to accept the way of peace, the way of love. Grew up to accept the philosophy of nonviolence as a way of life, as a way of living. Your generation have been called to make our country and make our world a better place. If you don't do it, who's going to do it? We didn't heard of the internet. We didn't have a website. We didn't have a fax machine. We had an old mimograph machine. But through the action of hundreds and thousands of students, young people, and people not so young, wrote about a nonviolent revolution in America, a revolution of values, a revolution of ideas. And you have a moral obligation, a mission, and a mandate to pick up where we left off. We studied the teaching of Thoreau. We studied civil disobedience. We studied the life and teaching of Gandhi. And as students, as young people, we would be sitting down on lunch counter stools and someone would come up and spit on us, put lighted cigarettes out in our hair, down our backs. And we got arrested and went to jail. During the 60s, I was arrested 40 times. And since I've been in Congress, another five times. And I'm probably going to get arrested again for something. Yeah. I, I said to each and every one of you, as best as I can. You know, I gave a little blood on the bridge for the right to vote. Some people gave their lives. The vote is precious. It is almost sacred. It is the most powerful, nonviolent instrument or tool that we have in a democratic society, and we must use it. So you must go out all across America and tell young people and people not so young, tell all of us, vote. The vote is powerful. And some of you smart, gifted young men and women must offer yourselves for public service. You can help remake America. You can help remake our world. You can help create what Martin Luther King Jr. called the beloved community, where we can lay down the burden of the vision. Because it doesn't matter in the final analysis whether we are black or white, Latino, Asian American, or Native American. It doesn't matter whether we are straight or gay. We are one people, we are one family. We all live in the same house. Not just the American house, but the world house. 
And furthermore, I said to you, be hopeful. Be optimistic. Never lose that sense of hope. Never become bitter. And in the process, be happy. And just go for it. The late A. Philip Randolph, who was the dean of black leadership during the 60s, who called together the March on Washington in 1963, where I was the youngest speaker. I was 23 years old. And out of the, the 10 people that spoke, I'm the only one still around. But Mr. Randolph used to say over and over again, maybe our foremothers and our forefathers all came to this great land in different ships. But we're all in the same boat now. That is true today. So we must pull together and look out for each other. We must redeem the soul of America and create the beloved community, a community that respects the dignity and the worth of every human being. I close again by saying, never, ever give up or lose that sense of hope for our struggle is a struggle that lasts for more than one day, one week, or one month, or one year, or more than one lifetime. But we must struggle. So go for it. Thank you very much. I don't know how we follow that. Um, I said backstage my, uh, the story in my family that I was told many times, my great-grandfather marched with Gandhi on, as part of the movement for freedom in India. And the closest I've ever felt to honoring that family tradition was getting to shake uh, John Lewis's hand. So um, maybe we can all give him another round of applause. <laughs> uh, and then to what Congressman Lewis said about never losing hope. I think all of us have seen moments where we think there are problems too big to solve, challenges too big to tackle. And the inspiration I get is from the people like those on stage with me today who are doing the actual work uh, of making change happen. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Carmen Rojas from Workers Lab. Evan Wolfson, founder of Freedom to Marry. And Brittany Packnett, co-founder of Campaign Zero. Uh, what each of them has in common, despite being from different places and focusing on a broad set of different issues, is that they are actually doing the work that makes change happen and, and in a way that can include all of us in participating. So I wanted to start for each of you to briefly describe the issues it is that galvanize you and when was the moment when you realized this is what you were going to act on. I'm going to start with you, Carmen. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. This is a real honor. Um, at the Workers Lab, we are focused on creating an economy that works for everyone. We believe that it's not on the backs of the people who work in our restaurants, hotels, retail stores, homes, that we should be building an economy, rather that we should be building an economy that ensures them a living wage, that, we, that ensures them benefits, that ensures them power in the place they spend the vast majority of time at their jobs. And so we are an innovation lab that invests directly into entrepreneurs, organizers, and technologists that are creating the vehicles for which we're building power for people who work in the United States. I was telling Anil this story earlier. I came to this job, frankly, because of my mom. She was the first in her family to immigrate. She's the second eldest of 17. Um, her first job was at a factory in San Francisco sewing jeans. Her second job was in an office building, cleaning that building. And that's when she caught her lucky break. She was offered a job to work in the building she was once cleaning. And the manager that hired her saw that her fate was tied in with the fate of the company. So they offered her a living wage and they offered her benefits. Um, they offered her training and mobility so she could move up in the workplace. And I often um, look back at my mom's experience and I'm very clear that it's because of this job that she was able to buy her first home, 
uh, that she was able to rest on weekends with my brothers and I. And frankly, it's because of this job that I am here today. And so I want to make sure, and the work of the workers' lab is frankly to make sure that we are not the last generation of people in this country that get to realize the, the dreams of our parents who work. It's interesting how much of the vision you're describing is not inventing something new from scratch, but ensuring something that we used to think was core to everyone. I want to come back to that in a moment. Evan, talk to me about the moments that sort of galvanized uh, Freedom to Marry being founded, but even the movement before that that sort of pulled you in. So in 1983, I wrote my law school thesis on why gay people should have the freedom to marry and why we should fight for the freedom to marry. At that point, the movement had already been in existence before me, and couples had already sought the freedom to marry and had already reached the Supreme Court, which had said no, like every other court had. Writing about 10 years later, I felt that we should not take that no for an answer. And I believe that having the freedom to marry was important because being treated as an equal in society, being able to affirm your love and dignity and, and connection to another person was important. The Constitution guarantees basic values and principles. We are entitled to them. Therefore, there would be a pathway to getting it. But I also believed that by fighting for the freedom to marry, we would be claiming a language, a vocabulary of love, commitment, connection, dignity, inclusion, equality, that would be an engine of transformation that would help non-gay people better understand who gay people are and why marriage, why inclusion matters to us as to all Americans, as to all human beings. And I basically wound up spending the next 30 plus years of my life working to put that into action. And I think the three core principles that I'm sure we'll talk more about, picking up where my hero, Congressman Lewis, left us, were hope, a belief that we could get there, tenacity, a realization that it wasn't going to happen in one battle or one year or even one decade, and clarity, having a clarity of vision, of strategy, of action and program that it would take to get the job done. And by getting all of that to come together and by spending an awful lot of time engaged in that work, we were able to win the freedom to marry here in the United States and I was able to put myself out of a job. <laughs> Wonderful. And it's interesting, there's a part here about giving language and voice to uh, a plea for empathy and understanding that, uh, again, you see this sort of latent idea that exists in culture and you're just trying to give people the ability to see it, to give voice to it, and speak to it. Yeah, in, you know, we won, after losing, 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 losing in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 2000s, even in the 2010s, losing, 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 by the end, we won in the last two years more than 70 court rulings in favor of the freedom to marry. And of all of those cases, uh, my favorite passage, my favorite sentence came in the case in which we won the freedom to marry in Utah. Ruby red, conservative, religious, Utah. The judge in Utah wrote, it's not the Constitution that has changed. What's changed is our knowledge of what it means to be lesbian or gay. That sentence encapsulated the entire strategy. It wasn't that we needed new, brilliant legal arguments or principles. Those were always in the Constitution. What we needed was to get the powers that be, the decision makers, the, our fellow citizens, our fellow members of families, to be able to see what was there and then apply these American principles to, to another group of people seeking to be let in. And that's what we were able to do. That's really powerful. So Brittany, I want to talk about the transition from the movement for black lives into coalescing into Campaign Zero. And how was there that sort of inflection point, that, that genesis moment where uh, you stepped up into this new movement and, and, and these new goals. Yeah, so I can't go there without thinking about what galvanizes me. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, and um, the, the two things that really truly galvanize me are freedom and young people. I was raised not on the Little Mermaid, but on the Eyes on the Prize series. And so freedom as a young person growing up in my household was a very clear ideal. Um, and it was also very clear to me that plenty of folks like myself and other folks sitting up here on the stage did not yet have it fully. Um, and so I'm fully committed to the idea that, uh, and, the, and the dream that young people, trans 
young people, gay young people, black young people, Muslim young people, um, will be able to enjoy the kind of freedom in which they can define themselves for themselves, as Audre Lorde talked about, and to go and show up as their full selves as we go out and change the world, to show up in our red chucks at the White House, right? So there is... Look at these chucks, y'all. Look at them. Matching chucks. <laughs> So what galvanized me to teach right, uh, right uh, a few miles from here in Southeast Washington, D.C., to teach third grade here, what galvanized me to work at Teach for America, where I have now started to work with people to create um, a civil rights agenda, which we've never had before, because educational inequity is rooted in race, class, and privilege. Um, and what galvanized me to enter the streets of Ferguson was this clear ideal about freedom and a love for young people. Because at the end of the day, Michael Brown was a teenager who went to a high school where we placed teachers at Teach for America in St. Louis, which I used to run. And his body laid out on the street for four and a half hours in a neighborhood that was his own after he had done all of the things that we told him to do, to graduate, to enroll in higher education. And at the end of all of that, his diploma was still not bulletproof. And so I found myself at this moment alongside thousands of other people in our community recognizing that if freedom was going to come, especially for young people, that we were going to have to put our bodies on the line to make that happen, that we couldn't observe this silently, that we couldn't sit in our living rooms, that we couldn't be armchair critics, but ultimately it was going to be our bodies that were going to cause a shift. Once we put our bodies on the line and actually mounted the pressure for people to pay attention in Ferguson and in Baltimore and South Carolina um, and all across the globe, we had to actually make sure that we had a plan for the dream. And so Campaign Zero really encapsulates what I like to call radical pragmatism. It's what motivates me at Teach for America, right? It is a radical idea to believe that one day all children in this nation will have access to an excellent education, just like it's radical to believe that one day we can live in a world where the police don't kill people. Every time we tell people that, people say, well, no, somebody's gonna die. That's not totally possible. At Campaign Zero, and my colleague Ned is here, we say zero is really the dream, and now we have to put a plan to that dream. We have to actually put action to that dream. So that radical pragmatism is about dreaming as big as we possibly can, irrespective of what the current reality is, and then taking deliberate action toward that. So that's exactly what Campaign Zero is. And it what, yeah. So there's an interesting through line here where it's, it wasn't, you know, freedom to have civil unions, right? And it isn't the sort of, you know, campaign very few, right? It's Campaign Zero. So there's this sort of ambition to the goal uh, that seems like a starting point. I wonder if you all can talk about why, why are you not taking half measures? Why are you not saying we should afford a little bit more dignity to workers? Why, why does it have to be the whole way? What do you say to people like, say, take baby steps? Yeah, so when it comes to workers and people who work in this country, I think that one of the things that we often forget in this moment is that the nature of jobs haven't really changed from the time my mom immigrated to today. We still need people to clean our homes, to service our restaurants, to work in our retail stores. And I think that right now, we are seeing this amazing uh, opportunity. And frankly, um, necessity, my colleague Jakarta Imani at the Workers Lab often says, necessity begets innovation. And so we are seeing right now this amazing opening where the context in which working people, again, four in 10, People who work in this country earn less than $15 an hour. Um, by 2020, 40% of our jobs will be classified as low wage. This is not just about my future and the future of my family, but it's frankly, it's about the future of our economy and the future of our um, democracy. What kind of a country do we want to live in um, if the vast majority of people need to make the tough choices between eating and paying rent, between paying for childcare or paying for healthcare. I think that this is, if we work towards these half measures, there is absolutely no way that in Brittany's uh, language, right, that we um, can realize the promise of this country, right? Like, look around, look at the people who are sitting right next to you. How amazing is it that we get to sit in a room with so many different kinds of people and what would it look like if 
40% of us had to make the choice between eating or making sure that our kids had good childcare. It would be impossible. And I think that the opportunity today is really to step up and to um, push on the boundaries that have been set both on our economy and uh, on our in our democracy, frankly, by inviting people into the conversation, saying that we can and will do better. So another conversation I was having with Anil earlier was, you know, we are leading a bunch of projects at the Workers Lab. Uh, one is an amazing project in Austin, Texas, where the Workers Defense Project, which is an immigrant worker rights group, has incorporated an enterprise to help do training, monitoring, and certification of the construction industry in partnership with developers. This enterprise has a promise to transform the entire construction industry, an industry where every day a worker dies. Um, we are working with uh, the Democracy at Work Institute and the working world to convert farms in, the, in California Central Valley into co-ops that once converted, they would be the largest co-ops in the country owned primarily by immigrant women. So it's not only about imagining what's possible, it's frankly saying that it is possible and moving towards it, right? So that's really thoughtful. I think, Evan, one of the questions I have for you, you're in a slightly different position where you set an ambitious goal and then uh, earlier this year, wound down your organization being able to actually say uh, mission accomplished, which is uh, not a common thing in activism, right? Like very, very, very rarely, I mean, you know, I think Congressman Lewis talked about this, right? It can exceed our lifetimes. And um, you got to see the finish line. And I, I, can you speak to two parts of this? One is about um, why you didn't pursue an incremental goal. Why wasn't civil unions enough? Why wasn't the sort of half measures that people offered enough? And the other part of that is, was it useful in galvanizing action, galvanizing people to participate, that you set a big, ambitious, audacious goal, as opposed to maybe we could take some baby steps? Yeah, well, so first of all, let, let me be very clear. The work of this campaign, Freedom to Marry, succeeded. And this campaign, Freedom to Marry, is closed. The work of our larger movement, and of course, all the causes we care about, is far from over. And so I think there's an important distinction between campaign to a goal, however big that goal is, and the broader movement and the range of causes and the range of work that we all believe in. One of the happy consequences of, well, and let me just say, in our campaign to win the freedom to marry, remember this took more than four decades, we had lots of losses. We took lots of partial steps. Keep losing until you win. Well, that's, <laughs> yes, and sometimes you can't always win on the opponent's time frame, but you can lose forward. And we've consciously made that part of our strategy. But we did take civil union. We did take partnership. We did take business steps in the right direction, et cetera. We just didn't settle for those. And we had a larger vision that we were always rallying to, which in, which in part got us there, but in part also got us there in some cases through baby steps. So I think it's very important as activists that we not put ourselves in an, un, in an ahistorical and unreasonable all or nothing, you know, 100% success or complete failure mode. That's not how change happens. At the same time, one of the happy consequences of success is people now ask me, so how did you do it and what were the lessons? And we're held up now as kind of a model campaign and I always point out to people, for most of the time, we were really more of a muddle. We were figuring it out and working through and so on, but we did do something right. And this is what I would leave with other movements and causes, many of which I also am very committed to and believe in. And that is that we succeeded on what I call the ladder of clarity. And the ladder of clarity starts with the top rung. Where do you want to go? Clarity of vision, clarity of goal. How do you define what winning is? Now, no one goal, however big it is, is ever going to be everything. But if your only goal is everything, you're going to get nothing done. You have to be about something. And then you harness the power of the something to the next something and to the ongoing something and the other something. But you have to have clarity of goal that people can rise to and be inspired by. From clarity of goal, you need to have clarity of strategy. What is the pathway for getting there? These and are then the rungs if, on the ladder. These are the rungs on the ladder. And, and clarity of goal, clarity of strategy. And you know, if you stumble, the strategy is still there. You still know what the pathway is. And hopefully others can know what the pathway is and can keep going because you are going to stumble. You are going to lose. You are going to get pieces. Some people are going to come halfway. 
you, you bring them along, but here's the pathway. Clarity of goal, clarity of strategy, clarity of what I call vehicles, the programs and partnerships you need to develop and encourage others to step up and contribute in order to fulfill what the strategy says to the goal. And finally, clarity of action steps. What are you giving people, what are you inviting people to do so millions can bring their pieces to the collective work required to get to the strategy. Pieces are not gonna be the whole, but if you reject pieces until you have the whole, you're not gonna get the job done. So that clarity of action step seems to me one of the, the galvanizing forces behind Campaign Zero. It's the, what am I gonna do? What do I need to do you know, after the protest is over? I'm gonna go home and keep working. Um, I'm curious about, one, this sort of the same question about the, the, the audacity of the goal, that zero is a really big number. And, and then the second part is, if you're celebrating these rungs along the way, and I'm gonna sort of bring this back to everybody, um, it's really hard in movements because people see the big goal, and so celebrating along the way, either people are like, well, why are you happy we're not there yet, or uh, you're not really truly committed because you're happy about something that's only incremental change. How do, you, how do you deal with those issues around galvanizing a community? You know, part of the reason why um, our goal is so, Audacious, it, it actually reminds me of teaching. So when you teach third grade in District of Columbia Public Schools, you teach DC history. And so I'm doing an introductory conversation and I put up slides of all of the various monuments and, and museums around here. And most of my young people did not know what these monuments and museums were. Not because they're not brilliant, because they are. Not because their parents didn't care, because their parents cared deeply about their success. It is about the fact that oppression by design robs us of our imagination and makes us believe that the only reality is what exists right around us, right? So something just across the Anacostia River, something just down the metro line was impossible to imagine in their own city. And so that is part of the reason why imagination and dreaming the biggest that you possibly can is so important because having the audacity to hope in something that big is in and of itself resistance, right? That is how oppressed people say we will resist the, the, the picture that you're painting, right? And we will have the audacity to dare and dream bigger than what you're offering us, right? So that hope in and of itself is resistance. And that's how you get people to dream radically and act purposefully. That's how you get people to come out of their house and put their bodies on the line. That's how you get people to do what we had um, happen after Philando Castile and Alton Sterling were killed. We launched a widget on Campaign Zero because people wanted those action steps. We had over a thousand people per minute on that widget for a certain amount of time contacting their state legislators. Now, if I ask how many of you know who your state legislators are, most of you will not be able to tell me, right? Because that's actually not something we often engage in. But people were going very clearly and saying, these are the kinds of action steps that I want you to commit to. And I want you to commit that to them right now because one more dead body is one too many. And so giving people the option, right, the, the opportunities to plug in in ways that are clear, that are easy, that are accessible, um, and that actually really drive action are important. But to your question about uh, how we engage when we take sometimes one step forward and two steps back, you know, I was on a panel last weekend um, during the dedication of the, the new Smithsonian Museum, and Cortland Cox, who is, um, I call him one of the, the OGs, right? He was one of the original members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And he talked about the fact that you have to settle, you have to resign yourself to the fact that this work will always be necessary but insufficient. So there is work that Congressman Lewis's generation did to get us to this point, and yet it wasn't the entire dream. If, the, if never seeing the full win is going to discourage you from acting in the first place, then this work is actually not for you. And I'm here to tell you that right now. You have to be okay with taking some steps back and taking some steps forward, having some losses, and figuring out how to show resistance by finding love and joy in the midst of it. Because that's how we keep going. It's when we're at protests and the drumming starts and we're dancing and we're singing along to Kendrick Lamar that gives us the fuel to keep going. It's about recognizing that this movement is actually built on love, love of young people, love of ourselves, love of our community, and that we've found so much freedom amongst one another that we're excited to be that free amongst everyone else. And so realizing that joy in the midst of the struggle helps us keep moving forward. If I, can I just yeah, add please. to that, that, you know, it's, it's very easy. <laughs> I, 
I think we would all agree it's very easy to take on the role of the critic, the complainer, the person who wants to catalog how awful everything is, the cynic. That's not how you get things done. Right. You get things to done by putting forward some inspiration, some vision that it can be better. And then, as we've all said in our varying ways, sticking with it. My usual line when we had a partial win or a step or whatever was happy, not satisfied. And I was happy. And I wanted people to feel happy. We are making change. We can win. The values of America, the values of human rights, the basic innate goodness to be appealed to are there. It's our job to create space for it. And you don't create space by pushing it down. Yeah. I think it, like the through line in our conversation, I was thinking before the panel, is that in each of our work, we're extending an invitation to people who are not ordinarily invited into conversations about marriage equality, about black lives, about people who work in this country, and saying, no, actually, you are a core part of the solution. Um, I, I am so moved and inspired to be on this panel, and frankly, think that this is a... Uh, an invitation that we are all extending to you all in this room and to the people who are viewing this to be part of our struggle, right? This is a collective struggle. The opening and description of this panel is about the collective we. And I think that there's a real opportunity to take that and run and to create. There's also an interesting thing that's coming in common with all of you are mentioning, which is, um, and I think to Congressman Lewin's comments, uh, Lewis's comments, is this uh, almost uh, faith belief in law. Um, and it's interesting because we talk about the sort of uh, right to your congressperson or uh, right to your representatives. And all of these things are predicated on the idea that there are some l fundamental legal principles in this country that are real and true and we believe them and we want to honor them to their full extent. And it's interesting because I think obviously I think all of us have seen uh, different forms of activism uh, maligned as being unpatriotic or, or you know, un-American or, or other kinds of criticisms that people love at this. But there's a, there's a clear connection here where in many cases you are trying to get people to interact with government more. They're trying to follow the law more and trying to work with lawmakers more and policymakers more. How much of that is your work? It's just education around this is what we could do. Yeah, I think one of the things that has struck me since we started the Workers Lab is how um, the orientation towards government amongst progressives um, has shifted so much since my mom came to this country. So when my mom came here, she came from Central America uh, in, at a time when her country was beginning a civil war. And she had an analysis of the state, right? Like she had an analysis of what government should do and could do for you. What strikes me now is that um, I'll talk about something very simple, minimum wage campaigns. So across the country, we're seeing more and more cities push for minimum wage to increase minimum wage. And although we are really excited about the passage of these laws, there is the other side, like the machinations of the law, that we need these laws truly to be enforced in order for them to work for working people. And I think we are trying to create the looking glass in which an everyday citizen, an everyday person who works in this country can look through and say, it's not just about going out there and making sure that we increase minimum wage. It's about making sure that this minimum wage is enforced and that it's not just enforced for me, but that it's enforced for everybody. And I think that that is the through line for us. It's actually, uh, above and beyond voting, taking back right. um, the opportunity to reclaim our place in shaping and framing this democracy in ways that actually reflect what we collectively want. Which is so critical because it's not just in a voting booth a few days a year that That's we right. engage in our democracy as full citizens. I think it's important that we expand our understanding of what democratic action is and that we get rid of our archetypes that it's just pulling a lever on a voting booth or it's just meeting with your congressperson or it's just writing a letter or as we were joking earlier, sending a fax. Yeah. <laughs> which we don't do anymore. Uh, it is, you know, I heard a college professor once talk about the fact that Ferguson protesters saved American democracy, that it reminded so many of us sitting in our living rooms that there were lots of ways to participate, that there are lots of for that. ways That's to confront. Right. 
and that it is actually our responsibility as citizens in a democratic nation to use every single tool we have at our disposal to confront this system, right? And to make it work for us. Because it is actually this, this we are the people from whom, uh, for, from whom this system actually derives any of its power. We pay the taxes that paid for this lawn. And so we are required to engage in all of the ways that are before us. And that means that we have to be open-minded when communities of color, when marginalized communities, when young people, when people of various uh, gender identities choose how they're going to engage with democracy, it's our responsibility to ensure that we're treated like the patriots that we are when we participate, whether it's in protests or at the voting booth, and not like enemy combatants, which is how we were treated in Ferguson. <laughs> Colin, Kaepernick, Colin Kaepernick is participating in democracy. Colin Kaepernick is forcing all of us to look at who wrote our national, our, 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 our national anthem, all three stanzas of the national anthem, and what his intentions were when he were writing it, and yet what he's being saddled with is a conversation about something else, right? And calling him a racist instead of recognizing that he is helping us recognize racism. And so there are lots of ways in which we participate in democracy, and it's up to all of us to continue to open up that conversation so that it is permissible for our democracy to look in many different ways. Ways. Do you have more there, Evan? Well, I, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, people like John Lewis, visionaries like John Lewis, like Dr. King, like Thurgood Marshall, Fannie Lou Hamer, Cesar Chavez, etc. They understood that the Constitution had not lived up to its promise. They understood that the system had flaws and that there was massive injustice. They devoted their lives to that. But at the same time, they also invoked the Constitution. They invoked the shared values. They created a, a, a dream and an aspiration, and they, and they connected with people, and they engaged them through citizen engagement, participatory, participatory democracy, and action. And these are, this is the story of America. This is the story of change. And it has two sides to it. It has absolutely the side that you just mentioned, Brittany, but it also is a lesson to those of us who are engaging in that way to remember that we also have to create space for others to rise. And we have to not expect it to happen overnight or in, in an immediate epiphany and turn off if they don't. You asked Congressman Lewis back when we were sitting there, what message would he give to young people who've marched or who have taken action and who've been engaged in the last month or year or two years and are frustrated that, it, that things aren't moving or getting better. And of course, his answer, as, as is your answer in your life Insist engagement, was keep going, keep engaging. It doesn't happen overnight. If you, if you shut down in cynicism, you are giving permission to the, to the system or the powers or the situation or the injustice that you are decrying. If you want to change things, you must stay engaged. My, my mantra in my 30 plus years of fighting for the freedom to marry was there's no marriage without engagement. We must engage people in this work. That was good. That was clever. That's slick. I like that. Um, I want to I get to one real pragmatic question, which is actually so, many, uh, so much of the conversation today has come back to what about cynicism? What about skepticism? What about people who don't believe? And I think any of us who've committed ourselves to activism or to a movement have our own moments of doubt, right? Where you're sort of questioning yourself or... Uh, you see a moment that it feels like too much of a big setback. When you hit those moments, how do you get through that? Because you're all leaders, and I think one of the things that's easy to do is to put all of you up on a stage and a pedestal and say, you're leaders and, and you're, you, you, you know what to do all the time. And I think one of the things that's going to be really inspiring to a lot of people that aspire to be leaders in the way you are is to hear, what do you do when it's hard? Uh, right now, when we're talking about people who work in this country, Frankly, I can just open the newspaper, right? So um, five or six years ago, a $15 minimum wage was thought of Im as impossible. Like you were a crazy maniac if you thought that you could pass a $15 minimum wage. That is becoming the standard for our country. When you open the business section of any newspaper and you see fast food workers standing outside fighting for predictable scheduling, fighting for an increase in wages. It's amazing. Like, I think that we are living in this moment when it comes to the issues that people who work are facing, in large part because of income inequality, right? That we have, um, everybody could see that we're at the crossroads. And so I, um, 
fortunately don't often have those times. Right. Um, All right, I like that answer. I, I, like that. I um, am, am so energized and excited by our collective vision, this idea that you can work um, and actually, again, pay your rent, take care of your family, send your kid to college. This idea that in the tech sector, right, we are seeing this amazing emergence of digital tools. So we launched today a platform called Together We Work that's focused on curating a digital community for young people who work. And what's so fantastic is that we're showcasing the work of these amazing technologists. So coworker.org that lets you create a petition in your workplace. Uh, Lumio, which allows you to make democratic decision making in your workplace. Fairy God Boss, which allows you as a woman to compare other employers. There are these really amazing um, tools that technologists are creating right now in order to make sure that young people who work actually have power in the workplace. And there's this deep cultural connectivity, right? So, on the platform, we, our first group that we profiled is a hip hop group called Los Racas, which is amazing. <laughs> yes, Los Racas, um, which is an amazing hip hop group. And they are talking about their experience as young people who work. And I think that there is an opening for all of us right now. Like, it's really about, I don't ever think about the drag back. Um, I feel like there is, we have to keep moving forward. This so you, idea. You find your inspiration in the people you're doing the work yeah, for. Yeah, no, the, absolutely. Evan, what about you? Have you ever, actually, Brittany, if you got something that, it, where you hit the wall and you kept going. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I feel the drag back. <laughs> you have to call I, me. I get, I get tired. I could be your pop um, up. You know, I, my voice perpetually sounds like this now because I have a bruised lung from tear gas. So, so it comes back and it goes and it comes back and it goes. There, I would say there, there are two things, though, that keep me uh, energized. Facebook memories reminded me that two years ago um, this week, I wrote a status about the first time I met Michael Brown's mother. It's actually here in D.C. at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Convention. And I didn't exactly know what to say to her. Right? I knew that we had been fighting in the streets for months, and you know, I said, We're, we are doing everything we possibly can to get justice for your son. We are praying for you. We love you. And I remembered in that precise moment that no matter how tired I was, I was not returning home to a buried child. And so perspective is incredibly important. But I also, like I said, being tired and being worn down is real. And so those are those moments where I really do try to center myself in that joy. It has been such a unique honor and privilege, especially over the last two years, to myself have witnessed and also personally experienced marginalized people finally living into the fullness of ourselves, right? I mean, the number of uh, African-inspired clothing that I've seen here today, right? And people coming and showing up as their full selves, bumping into people like Lovey, whose book is on the New York Times bestseller list, right? And, and, and knowing that there is a renaissance happening of previously marginalized voices that are finally getting the kind of credit and proper due they deserve. This event in and of itself is run by young people, by people of color, and it's incredible to walk around here and see how many people are making it happen at the White House when previously there would have only been a few of us in this spot. And so centering ourselves in, in the joy of the progress that we've made and just how fully we're able to show up and celebrating the magic that we all bring into this space, that gives me a lot of fuel. I get excited to see other people living into their truth and living into their promise. And knowing that uh, people also show that kind of love to me gives us a lot, of, a lot of fuel to push forward. Yeah, I would say Congressman Lewis and you know, both of my colleagues here made it very easy by talking about optimism, talking about joy, talking about looking at what's working, what's good. I think that is on the personal level. That is the thing you have to do. If you spend your time wallowing in the problems, you're not going to feel good and you're not going to do good. If you understand the problems but look at the pathway and keep working and measure your successes and inspire others and then take from others the, the support, the joy, the comfort, the solidarity, that's how you keep going. And I'll give you, that, that's the personal answer. And I, and I was lucky, I just temperamentally, much more so in my work life than in my personal life, that was my, my, my 
temperament. I really did, did believe that we were going to win, and I stuck with that belief, and I, I saw everything as, well, at least they're talking about it, at least we got their attention, and we're moving, and we're winning. On a, on a more uh, sort of technical level, or historical level, let me tell you one brief little story. In 2004, in the year 2004, uh, our movement, our, our community was targeted by 13 ballot measures that were pushed in state constitutions to cement the denial of gay people's freedom to marry and to roll back whatever partnership protections we were able to win. And many people, of course, were deeply upset and deeply fearful, and ultimately we lost 13 of those ballot measures out of 13. The, the month before the, the day, election day, when 11 of them were on the ballot, I gave a speech that I encourage people to take a look at. It's called Marriage Equality and Lessons for the Scary Work of winning. And I went through the lessons of history, drawing on other movements, other sources of inspirations, our own experience, and I'll just mention two of those lessons. Lesson one was wins trump losses. Losses are terrible. Nobody wants to lose. We lost 13 ballot measures. But any year in which you lose 13 ballot measures, all that cruelty, all that discrimination, all that unfairness, but also win, as we did in 2004, the freedom to marry in our first state and couples began getting married, the win gives you the power to overcome those losses if you keep doing the work. And lesson two, out of the many, Lesson two was you, you do always want to win. You don't want injustice. You don't want defeat. You don't want unfairness. You don't want unhappiness. But you don't always get everything you want on the timeline you want it. So lesson two is, yes, you want to win. But you can't, as I said, always win on the opponent's time frame. But you can, as I said, if you engage the battle and keep going, lose forward. Even a loss, even an injustice, even a, 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 a killing, a shooting, a tragedy, and there have been all too many of them, awaken hearts and minds. Get people thinking who weren't thinking before. Begin connecting the dots. And if you're there to engage them instead of to press them down, that's how you build a movement and then move a campaign on a strategy to a goal and get the job done. That's great words. Um, part of why I asked that question to all of you about the what do you do when you're down is I think one of the truths of activism and movements in general is they're messy, right? You have the sort of requisite infighting and, 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 and friendly fire and the drama and all that stuff that happens. And, uh, you know, I mean, just being real, right? Like this happens. And, um, and so uh, that tends to feed that cynical impulse or that, that skeptical impulse. And so the other thing that I noticed that all of you have in common and all the sort of great leaders do is this clarity of communication. And that seems to get past all of the drama, the day-to-day -day stuff. And I'm curious about if you have to succinctly articulate what it is that you are working towards, what, how do you define success? What's the, what's the sound bites you want to give? There's a lot of you know, books on Facebook, on Twitter and Instagram here. If you're giving people succinct sound bites to talk about the cause that you are fighting for, how do you articulate it in a way that others can understand if they're not well-versed? One of the things that we often say at the Workers' Lab is that every day we're going to work to make sure that today is a good day for people who work in this country. And so we, that is our North Star. We want to make sure that if you show up at your restaurant and you're a woman, that you're not going to get sexually harassed because you need those tips in order to pay your rent. We want to make sure that if you're a home care worker, that you have the benefits and the scheduling necessary for you to be able to pay your rent. We want to make sure that you're not having to make these false choices that right now the vast majority of people who work in this country have to make. And so this is my extended invitation to you all to let's make today and every day a great day for people who work in this country. That's wonderful. Evan. So I would say there, there are really kind of two, I don't want to say opposite, but two things you, you kind of wrestle with. On the one hand, as we all discussed, you, you want to put forward a vision, you want to put forward a goal that is affirming and big and true to what's needed and what you envision for a better world. And people want to feel good about that goal and own that goal and, and have it reflect their human aspirations and their human rights. And at the same time, you want to persuade people who don't quite see that vision yet, who haven't learned that language, who don't really get it, or who have 
ignorance or fear or prejudice or arguments that they've been taught standing in their way. And so I would say it's, it's not only about what makes you feel good. It's about how are you going to connect with the people who are reachable, the reachable but not yet reached, and bring them along. And that requires not just holding to your own, big and bold as you have put it out there, but also finding the way of connecting with the stories, the, the emotion, the authenticity, the personal engage in, engagement, the right messengers, the right messages, the right message delivery over time, and the shared values that will help people rise to fairness. If we only stand on what makes us feel good at the moment, that's not persuasion, that's preaching. There's a role for preaching, but we need both. I think we're okay. Nobody's out. Move. <laughs> and the walls came tumbling down. <laughs> Jericho. There you go. So often people think our movement is just about ending police violence. But what we are incredibly clear about is that police violence is a branch on a larger tree that is rooted in systemic oppression and racism. And coming out of that tree is inequitable housing, issues of employment, mass incarceration, health care, uh, inequitable education, which is why I do the work I do full time every day. So the dream, the radical dream, is not just to break off the branch of police violence, but to uproot the entire tree. So if I leave you with nothing else, our ask is to dream radically enough with us to believe that we can uproot the tree and to do the purposeful work with us, to act purposefully to get it done. Brittany, Evan, Carmen, thank you all so much. Will you all join me in thanking you?